My name is Tammy French. I'm here to talk to you today about chapter one from the textbook called The Art of Public Speaking by Stephen Lucas. The chapter is called Speaking in Public. Before we get too far though, I just want to remind you that if you want to watch this entire presentation with closed captioning, please visit the Communicate submenu at the UWW-TV website at uwwtv.org. So here we are, public speaking. Boy, for a lot of people, that makes some people sweat, right? Public speaking is kind of this, this larger-than-life format of communicating that a lot of us aren't super comfortable doing. But why do we still do it? After all this time, with all the social media, with all the ways of communicating we have in this world, why do we still use public speaking as a way to exchange messages? Well, public speaking is powerful. We know that public speaking carries with it this aura, if you will, of, of sometimes, hopefully, kind of mesmerizing audience, audiences. Think of it this way. We're in this political election cycle, right? Why do candidates, given everything going on in this world, why do they still try so hard to connect with their audiences through the art of public speaking, through the idea of either in-person live giving speeches, having these town hall meetings, or through, through cyberspace using Zoom or WebEx, having these kinds of conferences? Why do they still do this? Why not? have the candidates just type out their ideas, make a transcript, transcript of their speech, and email it to the whole world or, or mail it out or something like that. Why? Well, we know that there's something about this notion where when we see someone express their ideas uh, and we see them do it themselves through their own mouths, using their own gestures, with their own facial expressions, there's something inherently different about that. First of all, we tend to believe people much more so when we see them talking as opposed to just looking over something they've written, right? And so it's, it's a, a form of um, our, a way of making someone seem very genuine, very sincere, that the written word just doesn't carry. So public speaking is here. It's here to stay, I believe, no matter how many different kinds of communication we come up in this crazy world. And so it's our job, whether we are going to be in politics or maybe we're just going to have a more low-key kind of job, you're still going to have to do some public speaking in your life. I really believe that. I really believe that at some point, your boss is going to tap you on the shoulder and say, you know what, you've been working really hard on this project and I'd like you to talk about this project to this other department or this other group of people. And so you're gonna be put in that position. So that's our job here in this course, is to help try to make you be the best public speaker you can be and understand how powerful it can be. Now, here's some good news. Public speaking, and that's what PS on the slide stands for, public speaking is a lot like conversation. And conversation is something we all do all the time, right? So what are some similarities? Well, first of all, in both conversation as well as public speaking, we have to organize our thoughts logically. We have to hopefully put a little bit of, of ideas in, in order in some way, right? Now, if you're having just a relaxed conversation with your friend or roommate, maybe you're just kind of lounging and talking as your ideas flow through your head, that's fine. But think of a conversation where you need to go talk to your boss and you need to raise an issue with your boss that might be a little dicey. Maybe you need to ask off of work for a week and you know your boss isn't gonna be so happy about that. Probably we plan out that conversation a little bit in our head, right? We think through a little bit how we're gonna say things. And of course, it's the same is true in public speaking. 
in public speaking, we use care to hopefully thoughtfully plan out exactly how we are going to say something and what we're going to say and the order we say it in. In both public speaking as well as conversation, we should tailor our message to our audience. We've maybe gotten in trouble when we haven't, right? But here's a good example. Okay, first week of class, right? Probably so many of you have had your parents calling going, oh, schnooky pie, because that's what your parents call you, a schnooky pie. Hey, how is that first week of classes gone, right? And, and you so, talk to them about how classes are going and how things are with your roommate. And you talk about this amazing new public speaking class that you're taking, because that's what you're going to say, right? And so you, you talk to your parents about all that kind of academic-y stuff and, and so on and so forth. But let's pretend that during the same period of time, you have some old friend from high school that calls. Maybe this friend goes to a different college or is doing something different. And they call you and say, hey, how's your first week of classes going? Do you talk all about the academics? Well, maybe a little, but maybe you also talk about some of the socializing you've been doing, right? And maybe the socializing didn't really come into conversation with your parents. So we definitely tailor messages to audiences, even in conversation. And of course, we do this with public speaking. If I have a certain topic I want to talk about, if I'm going to do my speech about Instagram or something, well, I might talk about Instagram with an audience of younger people in a different way that I talk to it with an audience of older people. And, and so certainly we're going to tailor our message. And then lastly, in both cases, we certainly adapt to feedback. You know this, of course. If you're having a conversation and, and someone looks confused, well, you ask them. Did, do you have a question? Or maybe you just go ahead and, and re-explain something. And of course, that's true in public speaking as well. If I'm giving a speech and I notice my audience is, is kind of looking at me with a funny face, maybe they can't hear me very well and I should speak up a little, or maybe I should give an extra example if I can do that. If they're all pulling out their phones, well, maybe now's the time to pause for a break or to, again, do, say something that's a little more um, interesting so that I can get them back with me. Now, as many similarities as public speaking and conversation have, there are, of course, some differences. Public speaking, as you can probably guess, is much more structured, right? We have an introduction and a body and a conclusion, and that's usually true all the way through. Even within the content, even within the body part of the speech, hopefully there's some, some logic to how those main points are organized. Of course, we're going to work on that in this class, right? And in conversation, it can be organized but we can think of plenty of conversations we have that are really fairly jumbled. Or maybe they start off kind of organized, but then they take a lot of left turns, right? Another difference between public speaking and conversation is that public speaking typically uses more formal language. We are speaking to a wider audience, and so naturally we need to keep our language a more appropriate, perhaps, um, a little more professional, perhaps, especially if we're thinking of public speaking in the workplace. So we really um, think a little bit more about our language, and we use perhaps a little more care with our language than we would just in regular conversation, where maybe we would swear or use a lot of slang that would probably stay out of the, the speech. And then lastly, public speaking requires a different method of delivery. I don't know how many times in a conversation you've had notes in front of you or an outline or PowerPoint, right? We probably don't do that. Of course, in, in public speaking, those things are actually quite common. In public speaking, we often will stand and use um, a lot of other kinds of, of stage sort of um, delivery methods that just aren't, aren't as uh, normal, I guess, in conversation, right? Now, we can hardly talk about public speaking very much without talking about stage fright. Stage fright, whether we call it speech fright or speech anxiety or communication apprehension, whatever word we, we use, we know what it is. This notion that the thought of giving a speech sends shivers up our spine. Now, if I could ask you to raise your hand if you feel this way sometimes, uh, I'm sure you, a lot of you would be raising your hand because frankly, most people do not like public speaking. Most people get really nervous with this idea and don't like it and would rather not take this class at all if we could help it. Sp uh, speech fright is, is actually pretty normal. The next thing I want to show you is actually a video. This gentleman, Joe Cohen, is actually a folk music singer, but he expresses his anxiety and how he felt before he performed on stage for the very first time. I think he sums up a lot of the feelings, a lot of the 
again, kind of anxiety that perhaps plenty of you feel uh, as he explains what he went through. I have stage fright. I've always had stage fright, and not just a little bit. It's a big bit. And it didn't even matter until I was 27. That's when I started writing songs. And even then, I only played them for myself. Just knowing my roommates were in the same house made me uncomfortable. But after a couple of years, just writing songs wasn't enough. I had all these stories and ideas, and I wanted to share them with people. But physiologically, I couldn't do it. I had this irrational fear. But the more I wrote, and the more I practiced, the more I wanted to perform. So on the week of my 30th birthday, I decided I was going to go to this local open mic and put this fear behind me. Well, when I got there, it was packed. There were like 20 people there. <laughs> and they all looked angry. But I took a deep breath, and I signed up to play, and I felt pretty good, pretty good until about 10 minutes before my turn, when my whole body rebelled and this wave of anxiety just washed over me. Now, when you experience fear, your sympathetic nervous system kicks in, so you have a rush of adrenaline. Your heart rate increases, your breathing gets faster. Next, your non-essential systems start to shut down, like digestion. <laughs> <laughs> so your mouth gets dry, and blood is routed away from your extremities, so your fingers don't work anymore. Um, your pupils dilate, your muscles contract, your spidey sense tingles. Basically, your whole body is trigger happy. That condition is not conducive to performing folk music. <laughs> I mean, your nervous system is an idiot. Really, 200,000 years of human evolution, and it still can't tell the difference between a, a saber-toothed tiger and 20 folk singers on a Tuesday night open mic? <laughs> I have never been more terrified until now. <laughs> so we can see from Joe's experience that even people who perform sometimes go through this, this whole anxious, nervous, sickly, in some cases, feeling. So what I want to talk to you about is what we can do about that. First of all, please understand that, that speech fright is not something that is really unique to speaking. I bet a lot of you can think of other times in your life and other situations where you felt this same sense of, of anxiety and nervousness. Perhaps some of you are athletes or perhaps you are performers in band or music or something. How did you feel before a really big game or event or meet or performance? Were you feeling a little nervous? Did you have some butterflies in your stomach, right? How about a time before you took a really big test? Maybe we're thinking of the ACT that you took to get into college. Maybe you're thinking of an exam you had to take where if you got a certain grade, it would bump your grade up to the next level. So there was a lot of pressure on this one exam. How did you feel then? How about maybe you had a really big interview and you're sitting in the waiting room at the place that's gonna call you back in for the, for the interview and this is at an internship or a job where you really, really want this. How are you feeling? Are you sweating a little in your hands? What I'm getting at is those normal, anxious, nervous, butterfly kinds of feelings are a very, very normal part of life. And they happen to us for a lot of different reasons. The point isn't to get rid of all that. We couldn't if we tried. We can't get rid of all that. But what we can do, and what I hope we can work on today, is we can learn to manage it. We can learn to manage it. After all, if you think of an athlete before a big game, we don't want that athlete to be so calm, cool, and collected that they have no energy. We don't want that at all. In fact, we want a little energy, but we just want to learn how to manage it. So let's talk about that a little bit. When I was here at Whitewater as an undergrad, I had a, the privilege of having a professor named Dr. John Cease for my um, COM 110 experience. And he was a fabulous professor. And one of the things he taught us in that class was how to reduce speech anxiety with these four steps. And Dr. Cease taught this to me a long time ago, so I wanna teach this to you. Prepare, practice, breathe, and move, okay? So these steps will help us 
to get a handle on some of these nervous things that are happening to us. And when I say nervous things, I'm talking about some of the things I've mentioned already, whether it's butterflies in the stomach, uh, maybe you're starting to sweat a little bit in your hands, your feet, your forehead. Sometimes some of us break out in a little bit of blotches or rash when we get really nervous in this way. Sometimes we feel a little bit short of breath. Maybe we feel even a little dizzy. There's a lot of different physical symptoms that can happen to us when we're feeling this sort of anxiety. Some of these four steps can really help us. So for starters, prepare. The power of prep is what Dr. Cease used to like to call it. The power of prep is a powerful and very useful kind of tool that is at your disposal for this class, for all of your classes, frankly. And what it means is you have the power to start preparing early. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, Tammy, you have no idea how well I work under pressure. You have no idea what a great procrastinator I am. And I, I respect that. And I'm sure if you're writing a paper in history class or something, crunching it down to the last minute might be fine. But the problem is in, in public speaking, public speaking to, to do it well is really a two-step process. The first step is planning your comments. In other words, maybe writing up your outline or, or planning what you're gonna say. And the second step is practicing. We're gonna talk more about that in a minute. But if we, if we short either of those two steps, then we're gonna be in trouble. So conversely, if we have this power of preparation, we have loads of time to start getting ready, thinking of our topic, thinking of what research we're gonna use, thinking of how we wanna put this together. And by doing it little by little, bit by bit, we're going to have time for both of those steps. So this power of prep piece is actually twofold because number one, it has to do with time. You're busy, you are a busy student. You don't have unlimited time to do things. So if you do it little by little leading up to the due date, you'll be more apt to actually get it done and have time for both of those stages. But here's the other kicker, and here's why we're talking about it as it relates to speech fright. If you allow yourself the power of prep, then you're not gonna be rushed at the end, and therefore it will help your nerves at the end. I know, I don't know if you're like me this way, but if I have a morning um, when I'm getting ready to come to school here and I've had time the night before to sort of get a few things organized, get my papers and books organized, um, I don't know, get my lunch ready or something like that, where in the morning I can just get up and in a, a very sort of relaxed way, get myself together and get out the door, my day starts so much better, right? As opposed to the days, because I have plenty of these too, where I'm rushing around like a banshee because I didn't get things organized for myself and I'm grabbing stuff half the time. I forget something at home on those kinds of days. I feel very anxious because I'm rushing. That's the last thing we want on a speech day. On a speech day, we want you to feel, again, cool, calm, and collected because you've got your stuff together. So that's where the power of prep comes in. Now, the next stage, practice. You know I'm gonna say this, right? We have to practice our speeches. So, I'm totally dating myself here, but I've been teaching this class for, I think, like around 28 years. That's a, not that I've been at Whitewater that long, but I've been teaching a public speaking class for that long, that's a really long time. And yes, I have had students come up and say, guess what, Tammy, I totally winged it and I did great. And sometimes that happens. But I can tell you, it's very, very rare that that happens. Usually the students that have just winged it because they waited till the last minute, um, they've forgotten something important or they got themselves flustered. They didn't think they'd get flustered, but they got flustered and they lost track and you could really tell that they were nervous. So the much better idea is to practice your speeches. Now, the amount of practice you do is really gonna differ from person to person. For some people, if you run through your speech and practice it, I don't know, three, four times, that's gonna be enough for you. You're gonna feel confident, you're gonna feel good, like you, you know it, and that'll be enough. For others of you, you may need to run through that thing 15, 20 times, I don't know, in order for you to have that sense of, okay, I know it and I get it. But regardless, Practice. Practice is so very important and I recommend practicing in the days leading up to your speech day as well as the morning of your speech day just to make you feel better. Not only so that your speech is great, but also for your nerves because things that we have practiced we feel so much better about. Again, any of you who have ever played a sport, who have ever played an instrument or done any singing or anything like that, 
you feel better when you've done it a couple times. If you've done a couple layups, when you're in a game having to do a layup, you're gonna feel a lot more confident. It just goes for, it makes sense, right? The next thing is to breathe. Now this one probably seems ridiculous. Of course you're gonna breathe. But what we're thinking of here is what happens when you're kind of in the moment. So let's say um, it's the day of your speech and you're sitting in your desk waiting for your turn and maybe you're number three and now the first person goes and then we're on the second person. What are you doing as you sit in your chair? Maybe hyperventilating. <laughs> maybe you're really, again, sweating and, and just you, you can't even think of your own name. This is when breathing is so important. Now I wanna to talk to you about a really specific way to breathe. There's a technique out there called square breathing. And this is a great technique. It can be used before your speeches, but it can also be used in those moments when you're really anxious, before you take a test, before that interview. And here's how it goes, okay? You imagine that there's a square in front of you, all right? And on two sides of the square, you're going to breathe in through your nose. And then on two sides of the square, you're going to exhale through your mouth. Okay, so do this with me. Breathe in and breathe out. Doesn't that feel good? Namaste. No, I'm just kidding. But the point is, this slows us down. This slows down our whole system. If we think about what's causing our butterflies and our sweaty hands and our, our lightheadedness, it's because our internal organs are, are, are going crazy. They think they, we need to, I don't know, jump out and start running somewhere. They don't know what's going on. There's so much adrenaline pump, pumping through our body. And by slowing down our breathing, we can start to slow our heart rate. We can start to slow down some of those things. So breathing is a really, really important thing. Just slowly breathe. Now don't do this with your finger. People think you're nuts, right? You have to imagine your finger. But the point is, is slowing things down with your breathing will really help. And then the last one is move. Now, this is for when you're up in front of your class or whatever, if you're at work and you're in front of your, your department at work. Sometimes what we are inclined to do is lock in like a soldier and stand there really, really stiff. And that's one of the worst things you can do because now all that adrenaline and all of that blood that's coursing through your veins, that is nowhere to go. Much better would be to stand sort of shoulder length apart and kind of keep it real, real fluid and flexible and take a couple steps as you speak. So we're gonna get into this more when we talk on a chapter about delivery, but what I really recommend is when you are on a transition within your speech, just take a couple steps to one side, okay? Just a couple steps, and then talk about that part, and then when you're done, take a couple steps the other way, right? And now you've been moving, your audience thinks, wow, this person must really know their speech because they're able to move, but really, secretly, you are finding a great way to use up some of that extra adrenaline and some of that extra energy that's pumping through you. So these are the four great tips that I have for you. Prepare, practice, breathe, and move. And I hope that by employing these, it's really gonna give you a much better chance of success with your speech. Now, another thing to keep in mind when it comes to speech anxiety is that nervousness can be positive. Nervousness doesn't have to be negative. We think of speech anxiety in this really, really ugly negative frame, but we wanna reframe this thought and think about it in a positive way. Let's think about it as energy, positive energy. I'm sure this has never happened to you at UW-Whitewater, but I'm sure at other schools you were at, maybe your high school, you might've had a teacher that was so, dull and they were almost sleepy and they almost looked like they were asleep in front of your class right and what effect does that have on you as an audience member when someone like that is leading your class well you want to go to sleep too right so instead let's think of it as this energy can be really helpful you want an energetic instructor in front of you and you want to be that energetic speaker you want to have some enthusiasm and some energy so if we can reframe ourselves that's how we want it to be you know we don't want our athletes going out in front of a game kind of yawning all right let's play no we want them sort of hyper and hyped up and we want to be able to see that they're ready to go and they're anxious to go and they're excited we can think of that in terms of our speech as well now the last clue i want to give you or, or tip i want to give you is visualization 
Visualization is picturing yourself giving a successful presentation. So this is something, this is a technique you can use perhaps the night before your speech. So what you would do, find a quiet space, right? Some of you maybe live with a couple roommates, so you're going to need to really work at finding that quiet space. Maybe it's in the UC, maybe it's, uh, if it's a nice day, you can sit outside. And I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think of exactly how this speech is going to go. I want you to picture yourself sitting at your desk in your classroom. And then I want you to picture the, the, the speaker before you is done and people are clapping and you're getting up out of your chair and you're walking to the front of the room. I want you to picture looking out in front of your classmates and seeing all of their faces. I want you to picture beginning your speech. And you feel good when you begin your speech. You feel confident. You feel reasonably relaxed. You get into the introduction of your speech and it's flowing. And then pretty soon you realize before you know it, you're in the body of your speech and your classmates are smiling. And if you tell a joke, they're chuckling at the appropriate times. And then lo and behold, it's the conclusion. You're already there and you end your speech gracefully and your classmates clap and they're smiling at you. And then you walk back to your seat. This visualization can be very, very powerful. Now I know some of you are probably saying, oh, Tammy, goodness, that sounds like a bunch of hooey. But there are plenty of professional athletes and professional performers, professional speakers that absolutely believe in the power of visualization, the power of taking some moments to just mentally get yourself set for success. So I want you to think about that. Now, moving on. Oh, and wanted to add this as well. Remember that no matter how nervous you feel, so for example, if you are someone that has some butterflies in your stomach or your hands are really sweaty, Please remember that no one can see that. No one can see that. You are the only one that knows this is happening, okay? Even if you're someone that gets a little bit red and blotchy at times, you know what? Lots of us do this. And so we don't need to be so self-conscious of it because people are really gonna be focused on your, your bright, shining, smiling face and your interesting message. They're not even going to notice, okay? So keep that in mind as you keep in mind your visualization. One of the things chapter one focuses on is the speech communication process. And this slide is a pretty busy slide. There's a lot of things going on in it. You don't necessarily have to copy it down because it is right in your textbook. But I want to focus on this notion that communication is complicated. I mean, look at all those moving parts there, right? There is a lot going on with communication. And so whether we're thinking of a conversation or of a speech, whew, there's kind of a lot of room for problems, isn't there? There's a lot of room for error. So as a speaker, we want to try to manage and get a hold of and problem solve early as, as, as best we can so that we can get rid of some of those problems. So if we're thinking of our message, we're going to make our message as strong and as clear as we can. The channel, we want to think of how we're expressing ourselves and how we're doing this, whether it's face-to-face -face speech or, or perhaps through technology. Thinking about, again, what kinds of interferences could block us? Are there any potential noises or interruptions that could cause a problem? And what can I do to eliminate those before they even come into play? And of course, just thinking of, again, the whole situation or the context. Considering all of these things, if I think about them and try to work on them first, that hopefully will eliminate a lot of those problems. Now, as we get ready to wrap up, we have to consider this notion called ethnocentrism. Perhaps some of you have heard of this before. Ethnocentrism is when we believe that the, the group or the, the culture or the background that I have is somehow better than or uh, correct compared to the background or the culture that other people have, which is, again, incorrect or, or somehow wrong. Of course, this is not true. And logically, if our logical selves think about it, we know that, right? But sometimes, um, accidentally, I guess, we sort of get shifted into that. As I mentioned before, I've been teaching this class for a really, really long time. And one of my favorite things about this class is the variety of topics I hear. Every single semester, I hear brand new speech topics that I've never heard before. And again, we're talking, I've heard a lot of speeches, right? So, so I love the variety. I love the different interesting twists and turns that people take on topics. But guess what? I don't agree with them all. Some topics I don't even like. Some topics I find that make me even a little uncomfortable, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. 
and that is the beauty of this class. That's the beauty of a class like this on a college campus, where we can share different ideas coming from people with different backgrounds and different perspectives. You're going to hear topics, I hope, that you really, really love. You're going to hear topics that you can really identify with. But you might also hear some topics that mm, you don't agree with. You might hear some topics that make you a little uncomfortable. That's OK. That's OK. Because we're working to get out of our own ethnocentrism and realize that just because I see things this way doesn't mean that that's how everyone sees them. So what can we do to try to avoid ethnocentrism? Where the biggest thing is, of course, to respect other people, to respect the fact that other people have come from different backgrounds, they have different experiences, they have different opinions, and that's OK. That doesn't make you right and them wrong. It doesn't make them right and you wrong. It just means we're coming at this in different ways, right? And also, one thing that I think helps a lot of us is just to put ourselves in other people's shoes. If you're trying to think of, maybe you're thinking of a funny joke that you want to insert in one of your speech areas, one of your main points. If you put yourself in the place of whatever group might be the butt of that joke, would you be a little offended at that? And if so, then maybe out of respect for your classmates, maybe you choose not to do that joke or you alter the joke a little bit. So we have to realize that we are different people. None of us are the same. None of us see things the same, and that's OK. Frankly, that is what makes this so interesting. So with chapter one, we were talking a lot about just some fundamental issues related to public speaking, how important public speaking is. Again, I don't care how many Snapchat things come out, new technology, new ways of communicating. Public speaking is still something that you're going to have to do. We know that sometimes it can make us really anxious and really nervous, but there are ways we can handle that. And there's also ways that we can manage our own ethnocentrism just to make sure we're being fair to everyone. As we wrap up, once again, I just want to remind you that if you do want to watch this with closed captioning, you can visit the Communicate submenu at the UWW-TV website at uwwtv.org. My name is Tammy French, and this has been Chapter One out of The Art of Public Speaking.